And here's your prescription. I know just the pharmacy to get this filled. Who are you? A pharmacy benefit manager. A middleman your insurer uses to decide which medicines you can get, what you pay, and sometimes even which pharmacy you should go to. Why can't I go to a pharmacy in my neighborhood? Because I make more money when you go to a pharmacy I own. <laughs> no one should stand between you and your medicine. Visit phrma.org slash middleman to learn more. Paid for by Pharma. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics. Our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. Search for Economist Podcasts Plus and sign up to our free one-month trial. It is the season for holiday travel, and with Amtrak, visiting friends and family has never been easier or more comfortable. With no middle seats, extra leg room, and spacious seating, you and the entire family can relax the whole way there. So skip the bumper-to-bumper traffic or crowded airports and experience the gift of traveling comfortably aboard Amtrak this holiday season. Book early and save at Amtrak.com. Restrictions may apply. I'm Jason Pack. And I'm Alex Hall Hall, and this is Disorder, the podcast where we try to understand and order our mad, 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 and unfortunately sometimes bad, 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 bad world. This week we're going to turn our attention back to the Islamic world. The current conflict in the Middle East showcases that the West alone can't provide global order. It probably never could. The West is too conflicted these days and torn with internal contradictions and biases. In fact, to date, what we've seen in the Israel-Hamas war is that all the good solutions for moral order have to come from regional players. We're also going to look at how many of these countries, particularly the oil-rich Gulf states, have moved on from being the weaker partners in their relationships with the West. They've been dependent on us to buy their oil. And we've supported them with their security, but now the tables appear to be turning. They have started to gain leverage over us through their economic and financial clout and their investments in our societies. Just a quick note for our listeners: we spoke to James Dorsey all the way back in September 2023, before the violence had broken out in Israel-Palestine. So, in a way, that allows his interview to set the stage. As to what struggles for leadership were already playing out on the global stage in the Islamic world, and then our second interview with Professor Nathan Brown that was recorded in early December 2023, and you can see how these pre-existing struggles for leadership in the Islamic world are playing out in responses to developments in Gaza, as well as how any solution to the situation in Gaza is going to need to elicit the contenders for Islamic leadership. To step up to the plate. So here we are, Jason. I think this is a really potent matter, especially for our audience in the UK, because there's been huge awareness in the UK about the growing influence of Russian money. I don't think many people fully understand how much money is pouring into the UK. From the Middle East, especially Gulf states, and I can give you some examples. The Saudis have vast stakes in BP and Shell. They own parts of our newspaper landscape, the Independent and the Evening Standard. They have joint ventures with the bank HSBC and a stake in Jaguar Land Rover. The Gulf state of Qatar. Owns massive property and real estate across London, including Harrods, Canary Wharf, the London Stock Exchange, the Ritz Hotel, the United Arab Emirates. Also own vast amounts of real estate. They pretty much own the racing town of Newmarket. In fact, they finance some of the richest races in the UK, attended by the royal family. Let's not forget, Alex, that during the financial crisis, particularly when the UK's financial institutions were really hard hit, and they didn't have the reserves to bail them out the way the Americans did, the Qataris saved Barclays Bank in 2008, and 
They also saved in Germany, Volkswagen and Porsche and that whole grouping. And they were invited in. The red carpet was rolled out for them to save many key Western financial institutions from the 2008 crash onward. And what we're doing recently is we've been trying to reduce our exposure to Russian money or oligarch money from Central Asia and Russia. And we're also trying to de-risk and reduce our exposure to Chinese investment in critical parts of our national infrastructure. Now, I'm not saying real estate or banking or Jaguar Land Rover, a critical national infrastructure in the same way that telecoms might be. But still, we're increasing our financial exposure to money from the Gulf states. And so the question is, can we always rely upon that being a friendly, productive relationship? Or will that also come back to bite us sometime in the future? Right. And I think another key point here, Alex, is that Gulf investment is really sovereign investment. What do I mean? If I invest $200 million in the Newcastle Football Club, Yes, it's nice if it's worth 250 million in 10 years' time, but if it's only worth 180 million, but it helped us from getting sanctioned or it had 900,000 fans who now would be more likely to think positively of Saudi Arabia, we don't care that the investment is decreased. And the, the Emiratis in specific are willing to spend billions of dollars of their sovereign wealth fund to make them global leaders. And they don't care if those billions of dollars might have negative returns. So you need to look at these sovereign investments as having geopolitical logics more than they have financial logics. They wish to own these big ticket items like top UK banks and property and football clubs to have global leadership, not necessarily to make a buck. Another aspect about their investments is they are really embedded in the British establishment. There has been a recent scandal about whether associates of Prince Charles were facilitating the sale of peerages to rich people from Saudi Arabia who are making donations to some of King Charles's charitable causes. The UK has sold spyware to Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates and Bahrain technology they can use to monitor and clamp down on dissidents in their own societies. And of course, as it's well known, the biggest arms deal of the century was the British arms deal with the Saudis. And we have continued that by selling them arms to pursue their war in Yemen. And so I want to take it in a slight other direction. It's yeah. not about hard power. We in the West no longer are in a position of leverage over, say, the Saudis or the Emiratis or the Qataris. And this blows my mind, right? Because there's a million and a half Emiratis and there's less than 400,000 Qataris. You'd think with the great might of the U.S. economy, we could say, please just produce more gas. We need it. And guess what? We protect you from the Iranians. They say, no, we're not doing it. We don't like Biden. We're going to wait till when Trump is in power. We're more of a global leader on these issues than you are. And the answer is then Biden goes with his tail between his legs and we have to beg them because each of the Gulf states in their own ways have taken over key aspects of global leadership. It's quite a different world than it was 30 or 40 years ago, hey? Absolutely. So in researching for this episode and coming up with all this material about how exposed we've become, I realize exactly your point. Not only do we not have leverage, we're actually now dependent on them. I mean, so much of our wealth and income now depends on that continued pipeline of investment. So the tables have been turned. And so now feels like the perfect time to bring in our guest, James Dorsey. Yes, absolutely. James is a senior fellow at the Middle East Institute of the National University of Singapore and the author of a syndicated column and podcast, The Turbulent World of Middle East Soccer. I began by asking him, who are the biggest players in this struggle for global Islam? The major players to me are Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Indonesia. And what I think the major characteristic about the three states I mentioned is that they are all seeking to define moderate Islam, whatever that may mean. My focus has been primarily on the three contenders in defining what is moderate Islam and for leadership of the Islamic world. What 
do the Saudis essentially want from their increase in global leadership? And if we look back five or six decades from the 1970s onward, the Saudis, they set the school curriculum in many Muslim countries. They tried to influence Muslims in the West, in the Muslim diaspora. But what's their agenda today? First of all, I don't think that they're looking for global leadership. I think they're looking to be a global player. Okay. They're certainly looking to be a leader of the Muslim world, and to a degree, maybe even of what these days is called the global south. I think that's true for the UAE also. I think there's another way of looking at it. They are deliberately, provocatively at times, poking the eyes of the United States, testing how far they can push the envelope, yet at the same time, they're looking for a much tighter relationship with the United States, not economically so much, but in terms of security. But I think the fact that they are so gung-ho on a security arrangement with the U.S., I think is an important indicator. Let's talk about my favorite, the Emiratis. I have such mixed feelings. I love going to Dubai. I have so many colleagues from graduate school who are doing interesting things in the journalism and investment worlds there. You can obviously have a nice dinner and swim and all of that. But yet, Emirati foreign policy has been so destabilizing in the post-Arab spring states and then even in Africa. So what have they really been trying to achieve? Has it achieved it? Have they just disordered the world? Or is there a vision, like an anti-Muslim Brotherhood vision? Tell us. There's all of that. Whether one likes Mohammed bin Zayed or not, in many ways, he is a visionary leader. He has taken a country that has a population of a total of 10 million people, only one and a half million of which are citizens, and turned it into a global power. To be fair to him, he's very straightforward. He has no time for democracy, and he's obsessed with political Islam. And he is willing to go to great length, destabilizing countries, particularly Yemen, but also feeding Islamophobia in the West because he wants this focus on political Islam. What about how Emirati influence plays out in American and British domestic affairs? I'm shocked by the fact that pretty much every major think tank in the U.S., has Emirati donors. Where has this left us? I mean, and their alliance with Trump and the shady fixers of Trump world. They've played it very well. And they're very influential. You mentioned Britain. Look at a a think tank like Policy Exchange. I might argue it's the most important think tank in the UK for setting neo-populist Tory domestic policy agenda. Very close to Downing Street. Their agenda in terms of political Islam is a UAE agenda. A number of their people have close links to the UAE. The same is in the European Parliament. It's defense industry, it's other foreign powers, other interest groups. And the Emiratis, just simply because they have more money to spend, are a major player. Let's now pivot to probably the country that our listeners will know the least about who are involved in this struggle for Islamic leadership. And you mentioned Indonesia. Most Westerners will not know anything about their foreign policies or how they present themselves as leaders in the, in the Islamic world. So if you could step back and give us some big picture there. In the case of the Saudis in the UAE, we're dealing with the state, and it is the state that controls all. In Indonesia, we're dealing with the world's largest Muslim civil society movement and most moderate Muslim civil society movement, with which the current Indonesian government that has aligned itself with the group. If you take a step back and you look at the history of reform throughout the centuries of Islam, the reformers were always intellectuals or small groups of intellectuals, religious figures. In Indonesia, we're talking about a mass movement with a following of 90 million people, one third of the country. You're talking about an organization that has its own religious authority. Tell us about what's being interpreted there in this bottom-up fashion and and how it impacts both Indonesia's role in the world or is pushing a different vision of Islam's role in the world. The key issue here is whether or not to reform religious law. Okay. Indonesian Islam is heavily influenced by Javan culture. It's in many ways very mystic and has a history of tolerance. In fact, if you go back to 16th century, the then ruler banned the slaughter of cows out of respect for his Hindu minority. But in today's terms, Nadatul Ulama 
calls for religious reform. And not only calls for it, but actually enacts it. Explain. So in 2019, you had a gathering of 20,000 Islamic scholars, which issued a fatwa, eliminating the concept of a kafir or an infidel, Mm. and replacing it with the concept of a citizen Mm. with equal rights, irrespective of ethnicity, religion, gender. In February of this year, the movement had an international conference and called for the elimination of the caliphate mm-hmm. and replacing it within religious law with the concept of the nation state. So that's a fundamental battle that's going to shape what the Muslim world looks like. And the Saudis and the Emiratis have long sought to ignore Naratul Urama, but no longer can do so, and instead have tried to co-opt it. So this is in many ways an under-the-radar epic battle that's going to shape what Islam is in the 21st century. So you've sketched out three potentially different visions of Islam. How is this struggle between these different ideas going to play out over the next five to 10 years in your mind? It plays out at multiple levels. It plays out in vying for influence in the corridors of power across the globe. You're seeing that within the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, as the uh, chairmanship rotates to Laos and where the Indonesians have a far greater foot on the ground than either the Saudis or the Emiratis have. So you're seeing that on multiple levels, and I think that you're going to continue to see that play out. And the problem for the Saudis and the Emiratis is this isn't a powerful force that's setting an example of a much more politically pluralistic, religiously pluralistic, and democratic interpretation of Islam. So if you could give one suggestion to global policymakers to create a more ordered world, what would it be? Look, I think the fundamental problem at multiple levels is that politicians deal with band-aids. They don't deal with root causes. Dealing with root causes doesn't mean that we're going to live in a problemless world. And it's going to be tackling those root causes, which is far more difficult, far more time-consuming, and may take longer than your electoral term, but nonetheless, it's the only way that we're going to get towards an orderly world. After the break, we'll discuss how this battle for leadership in the Islamic world feeds into the current Israel-Gaza conflict. And here's your prescription. I know just the pharmacy to get this filled. Who are you? A pharmacy benefit manager. A middleman your insurer uses to decide which medicines you can get, what you pay, and sometimes even which pharmacy you should go to. Why can't I go to a pharmacy in my neighborhood? Because I make more money when you go to a pharmacy I own. (laughs) No one should stand between you and your medicine. Visit phrma.org slash middleman to learn more. Paid for by Pharma. Get more Mary without spending more money at Burlington. They're your one-stop shop for more gifts, more brands, and more surprises to check off everyone's wish list. Save on gifts for the whole family and stock up on stocking stuffers in the same trip. Find a fragrance for her starting at $6.99. Big tech deals for him and toys for kids starting at $4.99. Make it the more, the merrier. Burlington. Love the deals. Styles and selections vary by store. Here's something you've never heard before. Stop. This is Simply Safe. Introducing 24 7 Lifeguard Protection, only from Simply Safe Home Security. Now, monitoring agents can see and speak to intruders through our new indoor camera to help stop crime in real time and for fast police response. Get 20% off any new system with Fast Protect Monitoring at simplysafe.com slash Spotify. Advanced Home Security 24 7 Professional Monitoring for less than a dollar a day. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Listening to what James was talking about, and bearing in mind that it was recorded quite a few months ago before the eruption of violence between Israel and Gaza, it really begs the question about what effect that Israel-Gaza conflict is going to have on Islamic leadership generally. Is there a leader in the Islamic world who might be willing to step up and not just issue bromides or criticize what everybody else is doing, but actually offer to come forward themselves to try and tackle the root causes of this conflict. Who better to unpack this thorny philosophical question 
than that keen analyst of Arab politics who, over the last six decades, has been examining the role of Islamic ideology and the Arab nation state as they've jointly evolved. I'm speaking of none other than Professor Nathan Brown. He teaches at George Washington University. Professor Brown is also a keen observer of internal Palestinian politics and how, over the years, the myriad struggles over Muslim identity and Islamic leadership have been tied to the Palestinian issue. So I began by asking him, how have Islamic politics been fundamentally reshaped over the last 10 to 15 years? Essentially, what has happened is, you know, you take a look at what a modern state does, and it runs hospitals and schools and issues identity cards and passports and taxes. Um, what I would say is that political systems have slightly different approaches to it. Let me focus specifically on Saudi Arabia. What Saudi Arabia did in the 20th century was essentially said, look, we've got all kinds of funds. We need to build a state apparatus very, very quickly. We've got royal family. We need to find jobs for all these princes and so forth and so on. So we'll let you have the oil ministry and you have the ministry of electricity and you run foreign ministry and you run this and you run that. And they basically said that to the religious establishment, like you take care of religion, you take care of schools. And that ran into essentially the problem, the state apparatus that was simply incoherent, where one part didn't know what the other was doing. Security services were saying one thing, the religious establishment was saying something else that was creating problems in foreign policy. They were aligned with the United States, but they were funding approaches that the United States you know, was showing up and saying, how can you be backing this group in that? And so what is going on in Saudi Arabia right now is just a real tightening of control over the entire state apparatus. And now all of a sudden it's like, wait a second, there's a Saudi state, there's a Saudi line here. And by the way, Islam is not as central as you think it was. I would sum this up by saying the Saudi state was always a duarchy. The Wahhabi family got to run the schools and the madrasa. And then the descendants of Ibn Saud got to deal with politics and the army and the oil ministry. And what we've seen in the last 10 or 15 years is the canceling of that bargain, whereby the Saudi state gets to control both. And that this has changed also the way that Islamic politics plays out elsewhere. Now, to pivot to the second part of our discussion, let's talk some Gaza now. Not enough people are talking about how to get out of this mess because I wake up and I read the news and I can't take it, Nathan. I can't take it. I'm angry. I'm like, why did I spend two decades of my life learning these languages and these contexts if this mess is going on? So how do we capitalize on the position of the Gulf states, the change of the role of Islam in politics, to try to do what you're trying to do, which is bring about something like a second Arab peace initiative? How do we get there? Like you, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm depressed, I'm sad. That makes for a great analysis. It doesn't make for a great prescription. You know? Oh gosh, it's awful. How do we make it better? Oh no, it's only going to get worse. Th that's been my message to journalists, to policymakers. Uh, you don't understand how bad it is and, and it's only going to get worse. I worked with a colleague at Carnegie, Amr Hamzawi, and this is where we came up with the idea of a second Arab peace initiative. And this is where I get back to the we question. Traditionally, Arab states have been reactive and individual on this, on anything having to do with Israel and Palestine. You know, after the 1967 war, Arab states met at Khartoum, and Israelis will quote to this day the Khartoum resolutions, all the no's. All you do is say no. They said, okay, what's you know, capable of saying yes to anything? Yes. And you know what? They even put the Soviets in their place because we in America think of the Soviet as the land of the Niet. But actually, you and I, having studied Arab symmetry from Khartoum onward, actually, they say la, a lot more than even the Soviets said yet. There's all kinds of reasons for that. I mean, in the early 2000s, the Arab League actually endorsed what's called the Arab Peace Initiative. And it was essentially saying to Israel, okay, yes, if, if you basically agree to a two-state solution made the Israeli leadership panic a little bit because they didn't really like the terms of the Arab Peace Initiative, but they didn't know how to respond to a yes and. So they kind of stalled, and the initiative disillusioned a lot of the people who were, who were behind it. But it was actually a joint effort by Arab states. And what they offered Israel was 
peace, essentially, and integration into the region. My argument now is this may be an opportunity to do something a little bit along the same lines, but now with actually something a little bit different. Now, all of a sudden, what these Arab states are able to say quite credibly is, look, we've been working to just normalize Israel within the region. We've got security challenges that really need to be solved regionally. We've got the rise of Iran. We've got the United States is acting weird. Sometimes it's withdrawing, then it's coming back with full force. And sometimes it's like Obama who says all these nice things about Islam and then Trump comes in and he seems to hate Islam, but then he loves us. It's like, this is a confusing country. We've been punching below our weight. Uh, we need to be very, very active. So this is a time when they could actually get beyond saying, no to Israel, no to Hamas, no to Gaza, and actually put forward some kind of diplomatic initiative that would essentially offer various parties some attempt to manage the region. I think the initiative probably really has to come from the region, and this is a time when there's enough Arab states with ambitious foreign policies, there's an opportunity waiting for them. I think both you and I postulated similarly, which is that, hey, Qatar, Hey, UAE. Hey, Saudi. Your medium powers now. Put on your big boy pants and like do some regional ordering. You can't just wait for America or the EU to swoop in because the Americans are divided internally and the Europeans have no idea what they're doing. And you are the ones who have the knowledge and the money and the ability to coordinate this. Oh, and you have the legitimacy as well. So how can we deal with this issue of trying to order the Middle Eastern region against the disorderers, Iran and Russia, with this proximal issue, the burning tragedy in Gaza. Talk to me about how those two levels can interact and you can use Gaza as a fulcrum to try to create an axis of orderers against the disorderers. All of these parties have an interest in a region where this issue does not keep on blowing up in people's faces. They face problems at home, right? How can you be talking about normalization with Israel when they're slaughtering people in Gaza? This is an opportunity for Iran. And so the states, the Emiratis, the Egyptians, the Saudis have an interest in a regional security order that would look a little bit more like Europe, where states have real problems coordinating but the problems are essentially how to coordinate fiscal policy and immigration, not how to run basic issues of war and peace or for, to prevent revolution. I think that there are problems. Number one is the United States historically has been pretty jealous of its leading role in the region. This is a time when the United States, you know, under Biden has been very, very active on this issue, but it's very quickly running out of gas. Why are they jealous, Nathan? Because... I am a big believer in American and Anglo-American convening power and leadership, but part of that leadership is to empower our allies to take responsibility and to take charge. And you know, if I was blinking, nothing could make me happier than hearing that the Saudis or the Qataris want to host a conference that they organize, they make the phone calls, I don't have to fly and do shuttle diplomacy because they're doing it. Why would he not want that? It's a reflex, though, on the Americans' part. Something needs to happen. We've got to convene it. When you say, okay, we're going to sit back and take a supporting role, any parent would know. Sometimes people will do things that aren't exactly how you would do them. I think there's a second problem, too, and this is actually related to the first. Almost all American and European discussions start with where the Israelis are. It says, okay, whatever happens, Hamas cannot be part of the equation. There's reasons for the Israelis to say that. There's reasons for the Americans to say that. And it may be that a world without Hamas is a better world, but they're there. And the Arab approach, and certainly the Egyptian approach, and certainly the Qatari approach, is not to say Hamas is great, but they're there and we need to bring them in. And for the Americans to agree to that would be very, very difficult. And for them to persuade the Israelis at this point, I think would be extremely difficult. It would have been easier a year ago. Right now, it's just very, very hard. Let's expand out from here, though. I mean, how do you see post-war governance of Gaza? And then once you visualize this, shall we say, a city on a hill called Khan Yunus, how do we use that to get out of the conflict? 
I wouldn't start there because it's an idea that I don't think those Arab parties are willing to accept. So that's why I go back to this idea, not of starting with who's running the schools, but starting more with you need some kind of basic political framework. What you would need would be some kind of international agreement that says we've got to find some way of administering Gaza. And this is going to be the really difficult part. It's got to be one that whatever remains of Hamas says we won't obstruct and that the Israelis will say, okay, we'll let this happen. That's an incredibly tall diplomatic order. The Americans can't do it. The Americans wouldn't do it. The only diplomatic actors I think who could finesse that, I think would be a tall order, would be Arab actors because they can basically say to Israel, look how much we put on the line. Look at what we're offering you. And I think they'd probably have to talk not simply to Israeli leaders, but to Israeli public. And at this point, I think they probably could a little bit more saying things like, look, what happened on October 7th was a crime. Anti-Semitism is a problem. That's a language that Israelis have never heard from Arab leaders, or when they've heard it, it's been incredibly formulaic. So I think that there are ways they could do it. It would really require a sea change in the way, not in the way they define their interests, but just in the way that they act diplomatically. When the guns of October fall silent, shall we say, this will happen even sooner rather than later, what happens then? This is where my pessimism begins to take over. I'm not sure that day comes. I'm not sure the guns fall silent. So the Israelis, in your mind, will fall into an Iraq trap whereby they will be caught with the you break it, you own it rule, and then they will find themselves, what Bibi has said, of indefinitely governing Gaza. Yes and no. The current Israeli leadership, and it's not just Netanyahu, is very clear. We can't some contract out security over Gaza. So they're really talking about something that would mean ongoing Israeli security presence in Gaza. If An they, occupation. Yes. I would say a fuller occupation. In the sense, Gaza, I don't think was ever really unoccupied, but a much more intensive occupation in the security realm. And in terms of governance, that's not their problem. They're very, very clear on that. There's also something going on now, you know, in terms of population movements, uh, where basically you've got majority, the vast majority now, of the Gaza population having moved around as a result of this. And uh, the Israelis are talking now about like security zones. They've actually destroyed some of the housing in North Gaza. So you're going to see a very, very different Gaza. And so the Israeli formula is basically to say, we're here to guard ourselves. And what Palestinians do in terms of, you know, weights and measures and traffic light enforcement, and that's their problem. So I think any diplomatic initiative really has to get the Israelis to pull back, pull back and allow, in a sense, Gaza to govern itself. Without that, then I think what you do have is something that looks a little bit like Iraq or Afghanistan without the great educational programs and development programs basically have an ongoing occupation that doesn't solve Israel's problems but just kicks the can down the road to the next generation of leadership. Well, 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 Alex. You know things are pretty bad when someone says, post-war Gaza is going to kind of resemble Iraq and Afghanistan in structure, but, you know, in implementation be far worse. It's going to be fine, right? The way he was sketching it there, it sounded like some indefinite securitized occupation with very militarized anti-terror activities just popping in and out and like seizing Gazans, but then no educational or infrastructure programs, no hope of cultivating a democratic transition. That's pretty bleak stuff. Is that what you took away, Alex, from how Nathan sees things likely shaking out or... Are there other ways to order this disorder? Jason, I feel so bad for our listeners to this podcast because I wish we had some happy news to share sometimes, but I'm afraid I feel exactly the same chill. And when you and Nathan were talking about this feeling of anger, sadness, depression, and frankly, despair, 
I feel the same way. I look at what's been going on in Israel and Gaza, and I just feel this chill. I do not see how this ends. I do not see how it plays out. The level of devastation and destruction in Gaza is going to take decades to fix. And I feel like Israel is focused on the elimination of Hamas, how the Palestinians and the Gazans sort themselves out after that. That's their problem. Israel is focused on protecting its own security. Now, I understand why that's their primary need after what happened on October the 7th, but they can't just wash their hands of this. It's not like the Palestinians are going to go away. They are going to be neighbors. There are going to be Arabs living amongst Israelis within Israel proper. And in your interview, we didn't even get to the situation in the West Bank or the situation across the northern border with Lebanon and Hezbollah. Yeah. I think it's important to say that the Palestinians in general and the Palestinian people have borne some responsibility for what's playing out there. Of course they have. Hamas didn't get magically dropped in by the Iranians. It, it, it is a product of the failure of Arafat to reach a deal, the failure of the PLO to be non-corrupt and to win hearts and minds. So there's a lot of failures on both the Israeli and Palestinian sides. But I want to point the finger squarely at us, at the Americans. So after Rabin got killed, Clinton decided to double and triple down, and he had Camp David, and he and Barack worked together, and they got a plan, and then Arafat walked. But where have we been all this time? There's been this supposed peace process, but we didn't resurrect the Camp David solutions. We haven't prevented the Israeli settlements. We haven't gotten the Palestinian politics up and running. What I feel has happened is that the enduring disorder set in, and we've been squabbling and squabbling amongst ourselves. I want to share something with our listeners about how we in the West, and in America in particular, have just allowed the issue to fester as too difficult. And this is the dispute that I'm having with my colleague, Jonathan Shanzer. We come both from similar backgrounds, born in Philadelphia or New Jersey or New York, having elite East Coast educations, studying abroad in the Middle East, learning Arabic and Hebrew. And I, for example, want to work with the Qataris and the Emiratis to have a solution. He wants to work exclusively with the Emiratis. So he wrote an article in Commentary and in the New York Post that says, we shouldn't reward the Qataris for bringing the hostages back. We should sanction them immediately now and blame them for starting the problem because they have the Hamas leadership based in Doha and this financial sanction should happen now and we shouldn't coordinate with them even to get more hostages. And essentially what this hit me when I read this in the New York Post is like, oh my God, if Shanzer and I, who are coming at this problem from reasonably similar intellectual perspective, yes, he's a Republican and yes, I'm a Democrat and that's an important difference. But if we have reasonably similar intellectual formations and we can't work together on how to solve this, this is why American policy has cratered back and forth between Republicans and Democrats, pro-Emiratis and anti-Emiratis, pro-Cutteries and anti-Cutteries, and this is our own global enduring disorder. If Trump comes in, everything that Biden has done is going to be thrown out. So of course we can't make progress on how to solve the Israel-Palestine conflict. Yeah, well, I want to come back on that because it reminds me of the episode we had with Jonathan Powell, where he said, in order to make peace, you have to talk to your enemies. And I'm also reminded of Henry Kissinger. And there have been endless reviews of his life and his achievements. And he's always been hailed by some as this amazing statesman who led the breakthrough to China and helped end the Vietnam War. But others have said, yes, but it was at the cost of selling South Vietnam down the river and his policies in Latin America and other parts of the world. He used poorer, more vulnerable people as pawns in this wider geopolitical game. And this is the moral maze of modern diplomacy. Often there are no perfect solutions and you do have to talk to your enemies and you do find yourself making very difficult moral compromises. We are never going to get peace 
if neither side can ever accept that there are legitimate grievances on the other side and there are wrongs that have been committed by both sides until we can critique ourselves and understand our opponent's point of view, there will never be peace. And the problem we've got in Israel and Gaza is the sheer scale of anguish and atrocity and violence. And this is a small society. Everybody knows someone who is a relative of a hostage or who has lost family members in Gaza. And asking these people to forgive or forget and reconcile is really hard. And so it needs countries from outside to help create that environment to try and heal these divides. It can't be left to the Israelis and the Palestinians themselves. So the question is, is the West in the position to do that, or does it need to come from the region? Yeah. So although Nathan didn't use these words, I took something away from what he said that I never thought about in my 20 plus years of working on this conflict. Maybe the governance of Gaza is an existential issue for the Egyptian state. The Brotherhood killed Sadat for making peace with Israel. The Brotherhood took over after Mubarak as a result of the elections that got Morsi elected. The Brotherhood took a coup to be defeated. Today, the dictator of Egypt, General Sisi, he's more afraid of the Brotherhood than he is of a war in Gaza, which could even kill 100,000 people. He's really afraid that if he's put in a position to govern Gaza, it will delegitimize him. It will allow in a pro-Hamas, pro-Muslim Brotherhood population demographic, or it will delegitimize the Egyptian army so that a pro-Hamas, pro-Muslim Brotherhood insurgency from even within Egypt could come about. You need to empathize with the fact that the Egyptian state views that they can't let the Gazan refugees in and that they can't govern Gaza because the entire edifice of the Egyptian regime could collapse. All right. So what do the Egyptians or the Gulf states want? What solution do they see? I fear, Alex, that the worse the problem gets in Israel-Palestine, the more that the surrounding Arab states have to default to their old pre-1970s positions of this isn't our problem. We're not taking Palestinian refugees. We're not letting them settle here. They're Palestinians. It's their issue. And that's what's so worrying because that's a lose-lose situation. And that's why to go back to Jonathan Shanzer's perspective, how can we ask the Islamic world to get on the same page? If American foreign policy intellectuals who've been working on the Israel-Palestine conflict and studying Arabic and Hebrew in similar places can't even agree on the terms of engagement and how we should approach things. That's like the discussion we had about how can we come up with sensible solutions if we can't even agree on basic facts as well. You throw disinformation into the mix and it makes it even more murky. But I just want to come back. You said that you could see this going back to pre-1970s era where the Arab states just wash their hands of it. How do we incentivize them? The problem is that Netanyahu is such a lunatic. Even sensible Gulf leaders sympathize with Israel, potentially more than they ever had, say, the morning of October the 8th. Now they're less willing to help them because the Israelis have put the worst face on their international role and on the reasons why they need to be in Gaza and the West Bank. It's really been, it's been a sorry display of what populism leads to, Alex. I don't think that this is about Israelis in particular or Zionism in particular or settler colonialism. It's about what happens when neo-populists who don't respect the value of a human life, the value of truth, and the value of institutions get to power. If we had Trump running our country and something like this happened, there would be the same bullshit crazy overreaction. So of course, why would the Qataris or the Egyptians for that matter, want to help out in Israel, which is run by these kind of lunatics? And so we end up back at square one. It'll be no, you mean United Nations. negative 97. Huh. It'll be the United Nations putting out emergency pleas for humanitarian aid. And who will give the humanitarian aid? It will be the Europeans 
rebuilding those, I can't bring myself to say the F word, those hospitals, those schools, those facilities that the Europeans have funded time and effing time again, only for them to be bombed flat. The Europeans will pay for those to be rebuilt. The Americans will try to exert some leverage and the rest of the world will stand on the sidelines and blame us. Welcome to Disorder. Well, I think that's the end of this episode. We're going to have to come back with something more positive next time, Jason. If you too want to help order the disorder and get a grips on this mad, 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 bad, 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 bad world, why don't you just tap follow right now so that you will be ordered and be getting every episode as soon as it launches. We're also on social media. You can search Disorder Show. And for more on today's topics, follow the links in the show notes to our website. I think having a surname, Hall Hall, I tend to get rather fixated on Mad Mad and Bad Bad. So, <laughs> thank you for listening today. Our producer is George McDonough, who makes sense of our musings. Our executive producer is Neil Fern. Thanks for listening, and I hope you have an orderly week. Over and out. Thank you.